Good morning to you all. Salam alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, very, very warm welcome and welcome back. I'm Etna Trainer, and I'll be your host for this session. And I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted. It's just such a real honor for me to welcome back here to Dubai the president of Mauritius, Amina Gurub Fakim. So wonderful. Thank you so much you. for being with us. She has just arrived. She's been incredibly busy, so we're, we're absolutely <laughs> thrilled that you've taken the time to actually be with us. Now, our topic today is going to be around brain drain and reversing the brain drain. And this, unfortunately, is particularly um, sad, I think, in terms of Africa. I think every country has a brain drain. Cities and villages deal with this. But in terms of Africa, we're looking at the talented people in the country, many of them who actually have access to education abroad, partly, and then maybe don't come back. So perhaps they have great intentions in terms of getting an education that's going to be very valuable for them, but maybe then they're kept, kept abroad. So we look at the brain drain, give us a feel for how bad it's been perhaps over the last few years, and then we'll, we'll have a talk about what uh, people like yourself indeed, and what governments and what influencers to a stage are actually doing to reverse that. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for this very interesting question. I think, uh, You've mentioned brain drain. I think the first thing we have to ask ourselves, why do people leave? I don't think anybody wants to leave uh, his home or his country uh, to go to a foreign place and uh, uh, to, to work and, and to be you know, kind of uh, re get removed from, from the family and everything else. Um, now, I will just uh, give you uh, an, a conversation I heard a few years ago about brain gain back to the countries and the regions. Uh, I was in the United States, and uh, there were some people who were talking that uh, they are concerned about a few regions, about uh, the reverse, that is, people going back from the U.S., going back. Uh, they say, you know, we have no problem with Africa because uh, no Africans want to go back. We are having some concern yes. with uh, people in, in India and in Asia, uh, but we managed to stem that. But there's one country that we are worried is China people are going back to China. And uh, so they're asking the question, why is this the case? Now, if we look at what the Chinese government has been doing for the past uh, few years, is that they are building the ecosystem, which is perhaps better than where these people are working at in the United States or in any developed countries, so that when they come back to, uh, to, that, uh, to, back to China, they, the institution is uh, of such level that there's no need to go back. So you have to create the ecosystem so that the talents want to be there and want to stay there. So my, uh, the, what I'm looking, what I'm trying to do is that it may be too ambitious for me to say that I will try to promote brain gain in Mauritius in Africa, but I think if we can promote brain circulation, especially in the era we're living in, I think that's going to be a tremendous boon for the continent. Now, we would like to get you involved in this conversation. We only do have half an hour, but I am happy to take a few questions. But also, we have a poll question. So we'd be interested to see what you think, and then we'll certainly have a chat around that, too. And again, I think we'll get that poll question up here. You have the app open, the Slido, and we're going to be looking to ask you what you feel. What is the most important factor in reversing brain gain? So we were going to have that, and I'm sure they'll uh, get the technology up and actually get that ready and make sure we can have that question and you can participate. Uh, you mentioned where there, so we have it here. So again, what is the most important factor in reversing the brain gain? So have a look there. Do you think it's better education at home or do you actually think it's innovative governments? Um, so again, I think we're, we probably are going to come up with a little bit of a balance on that. But you've just mentioned uh, the brain circulation. Tell me a little bit about that, too. So what do you mean when you talk about brain circulation? You know, there are many schemes that have been put in place uh, so as to link up, tie up, for example, young Africans, uh, talented Africans, for example, with uh, countries where there's a lot of diaspora, for example, in Canada, in the United States, and in Europe. Now, if we have these talented Africans who are already there in, in the West, and who've made it, and they're prepared to mentor. 
the young people, uh, the young graduate or the young entrepreneur or the young innovative South African, for example, who wants to make it. I think spending time mentoring by these people who are there, uh, either they come and spend some time in Africa and identify uh, what we know the problems are, but the opportunities that uh, these people need to make it. I think if we can have this mentoring, I think it's already very, very important. And of course, make sure that the African also leaves and goes uh, to that place, the diaspora, where they can share experiences. And I think this is in the age of technology. We need to be able to get all these good experiences being shared. And there's so much to learn. And you know, we will not live long enough to learn from our mistakes, so we might as well learn from what other people have made it and done it. Indeed, and when you mention technology and you look at the availability of technology, and in many ways we talked yesterday about the great equalizer that technology and digitization has actually become, whereby 10 years ago perhaps people in Africa and young entrepreneurs with a vision or with an idea were probably stuck in their village or town and that's, it didn't go much further. Mm -hmm. But now they can see their peer group around the world doing something about it. How important do you think technology and the openness of you know, global digitization, how is that helping and how can it help perhaps keep interested entrepreneurs at home? You know, technology is being used uh, as a panacea for just everything, yeah. okay? I think if we want technology to work for us, there has to be a degree of preparedness among the people, the young people. And I think this is, if you look at what AI is going to do, the big disruptor, but what we have to ensure is that the youth in Africa, and this we talk about the youth dividend in Africa, the education they're getting, whether it's preparing them to be, to be critical thinkers, we are going away with road learning, we are preparing them for quality education, so that these young children who are there, they will be prepared for, they will be actually, uh, you know, be in a position uh, to adapt to a world where the jobs don't exist and they have to create it, have to make it. And uh, this is the kind of mind shift, the kind of change that we have to engage with now. So prepare our kids through quality education to adapt to a world where these jobs will not be there. The jobs need to be created out there. And this is where we, we have the power of technology to provide this dis disruption and make it happen. I think when we look around the world, we're hearing a lot of criticism at the moment about educational system and a lot of business saying that they don't get the graduates ready for work. They might be well educated, but they're certainly not educated to, to hit the workforce running. Mm -hmm. So is there a need perhaps to get business more involved in the educational system in terms of, because ultimately we all want a job when we finish education. It's, it's the normal route, yes. and I think it's what everybody wants to do. But again, how do you actually shift that? And of course, in your position in the government, you, you can impact that and you can shift the thinking and bring the parties together to do something about that. So how can the rest of the country, all of the African countries yes. do this? You know, the African uh, education landscape uh, has been preparing the youth for civil servant jobs. Yes. Uh, this is something that we have to admit that has been the case. Those countries that have invested in science, technology, innovation, those countries that have invested in women, these are the countries that are reaping the benefits. And I think what you're saying in terms of uh, how do you actually ensure uh, employability of these young people is first of all, you need to look at the curriculum. Is the curriculum sufficiently diversified? Are we getting the private sector on board to actually shape up the curriculum? Are these kids going out there getting hands-on experience during, their, uh, during their, uh, the, the thesis or whatever graduate studies? I mean, these are the, the, the shift that we have to, to, to bring to change so that the kids, when they are out there, the graduate, they are getting, they have got an education, they have got a training where they are adapted, they are, they are, they are fit for purpose, as I say, yes. for, that, for that particular system. So these are things that we have to look at critically again uh, so that it works for us. And again, let's look at how do you perhaps, you know, encourage an entrepreneurial spirit. Your own story, I think, is, is a fascinating one, and perhaps you can share that with us in terms of why you took the chance. We heard earlier in the last panel talking about uncertainty, which was very uncertain for what you were doing, um, the risk that's involved, how do you measure that, how do you analyze it, and what is it that makes you make that shift in your mind that says, this is what I'm going to do? 
Well, in my first life, I was <laughs> an academic, and I was working in herbal knowledge. And once I went to a conference and I saw a display, you know, they have display of products. Yes. And uh, there was a product which was being displayed, and this product was how to regulate your blood sugar, not to say diabetes, because you can't make claims when you are in this, in this space. This uh, nutri nutraceutical compound was being promoted, was being sold, and the literature which was used to validate the findings was essentially my work. Okay. And my work was out there in the public domain because there was no protection of the IP because in academia you publish or you perish. So that got me thinking, I thought there's something wrong here. There's somebody making a business, making you know, money out of research that I was doing, so I must do something about it. And then in my second life, I decided to take the risk, and uh, I met uh, with this uh, French entrepreneur, and I said, why not, let's go for it. It was not an easy decision, because my comfort zone was academia, uh, but I decided to, you know, to go out there in the wide world and incorporate the business, which was to translate this research into an innovative sector, providing ingredient for the pharma, cosmetic, and the food industries, because we know there is a wave of uh, healthy living, reinforced food, uh, green uh, cosmetics, and of course, uh, phytotherapy uh, drugs, which of course uh, is accepted uh, economically, it's, accept it's accessible to public, and also it's, um, it's culturally accepted to be treated with your own traditional knowledge. So this is what I did, and uh, then my third life, I'm here. <laughs> but as I said, the, again, the, the issue is to say that a lot of research is going on in yes. Africa, but we need to take that research to protect it with the appropriate IP so that it becomes an engine for wealth creation. And this is again something that we have to inculcate in our, in our youth, that they need to go down that route as well. And entrepreneurship will be the way forward for Africa, because with so many young people reaching the job market, I think the World Bank figures puts it to about 11 million graduates per year, there's no way any government will be able to produce that number of jobs. So we need to go down that route, but which route, which area, how to actually mainstream technology to make it happen, this is the, the, the question that we have to address. Just coming back to what you were talking about again in terms of research and innovation, and now you have actually put in place a coalition, particularly looking at Africa in terms of research and innovation. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there and how you believe that's going to make a difference? Because obviously you have an, an end in goal, an end in sight with this. Um, prior again to joining uh, the, the presidency, I was a member of the governing council of the African Academy of Sciences. And uh, during that time, we were actually uh, training capacity building for uh, young Africans for the masters, PhD and postdocs. Uh, so when I came, I, uh, we've shaped it into a coalition for African research and innovation. Uh, so as to precisely build the ecosystem and give them the appropriate uh, training that they need for people to come and stay and work in Africa. Why it's important to work in Africa? We, ha we are thankful to donors for having given the seed money, yes. but again, this is a message that I have to all my colleagues, that if we want to build capacity for our own people, we need to put money in our own pockets. And we need to actually train our own people, and especially women as well. I make the case for women because I keep saying, it may sound cliche, but uh, you cannot win a football match by leaving 52% of the team behind. Sure. So what we're trying to do is precisely to go through a process of merit. So those scientists who are doing good work can become centers of excellence because you don't become a, you actually, you make good work and that become a center of excellence. So this is driven by uh, major donors. We have the Gates Foundation, we got the Wellcome Trust, uh, we got the USNIH. So these are uh, institutions that, that is partnering with us so as to drive our agenda, the Africa agenda, because there are so many uh, challenges that will not be dealt with by donor only. It has to be done by African governments and this comes with training and investing in our own people. And again, I mean, a huge credit to you to, to bringing these people together too and to actually maintaining that interest because I think when you get people at that level, it's easier then to attract more people. Um, but again, as you say, it's also about, you know, people in Africa taking that very seriously mm -hmm. as well. It's great to have big influence around the world, believing in Africa, but again, it's, it's probably the, the self-belief you want. Bring it back to 
Mauritius, if you will, and in terms of what you're going to do there. Huge development in the country. Again, we look at the financial services there. We look at the growth over the, the last few years, really, and putting the country on the map. What do you see in terms of making sure that you can maintain the bright, the best and the brightest and make sure that they, they may go abroad and get that experience, but they're going to bring it home and it's going to be there for the use and the benefit of the country? Mauritius has 50 years of uh, history, uh, post-independence history, and next year will be 50 years. And I think if we look at uh, the way we have progressed economically, every 10 years uh, we've seen kind of new ideas and new pillars on which the economy is firing. Now, immediately after independence, I must say that uh, the per capita was about $200, and now we are an uh, upper-middle-income country, yes. about, around about $10,000 in terms of, per ca of, in terms of uh, uh, the, the income. Uh, but having said this, it didn't happen uh, like this. There has been planning. There is no such thing as a Mauritian miracle. It's been strategic planning in terms of right policies. And one of the major, if I may say, landmark has been providing free education in 1976. And free education meant that parents didn't have choices to make to educate the boys and the girls. And these people who were working in the sugarcane fields were those actually going into uh, manufacturing and going into the financial sectors. And as you say, we are improving all the indicators so that we remain, uh, we, we, you know, we, we remove one of the you know, best destination for investment. And this is something that uh, we pride in, and uh, we're also doing a lot of it. It's work in progress. But our duty is to improve on all the indicators, be it in uh, ease of doing business, corruption, and all these you know, flagship indicators that we have to work on. And of course, a big congratulations. You're up there in terms of what number one in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of ease of doing business. So that stamp of credibility, I mean, it's huge for Mauritius. And again, it puts that country out there globally um, being, holding that key position, and I believe, I, I did have a note, forgive me, what were you worldwide? 25th globally. That's, that's very, very impressive when you look at that. Yes. So this is the type of accolades I think we need to see more of in Africa, and we need to see more coming about. I'm just looking at the results on the poll at the moment, and again, it comes back to what our audience is really looking at here, that a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem is very important. Education is the lowest in this one, uh, innovative governments. Um, but I would have thought that perhaps do you find an entrepreneurial ecosystem if you don't have the basis of education? And I think they saw uh, UNESCO, one of the UN reports, realized that after Djibouti had put in place the university there and was bringing out more graduates in science and engineering, there were jobs for them. They stayed at home. They didn't mm. leave as much. So I suppose it's a bit part and part. Yeah. Uh oh, and education has just got lower. So there's a huge <laughs> um, push there on entrepreneurial. The opportunities for entrepreneurs in Africa, and we've listened to some of the very successful ones over the last two days. I mean, I would imagine it is tremendous. It is. I mean, it also depends in entrepreneurship where you want to pitch it. If you want to pitch at the high end, you'll need a very strong uh, education, and of course, high education. and. Uh, if you want to go into the knowledge economy, we're talking about high volume, uh, you know, high return and low volume. I mean, you need to have a very strong, uh, powerful, higher education system. And this goes back to the, so it depends on, on, the, on the tier of entrepreneurship. It depends where you want to pitch yourself. So we in Mauritius, we, have, we are pitching ourselves to become a knowledge economy. So you need very strong institution. This is something that we are doing both in the public and the private sector. And if you look at the private sector now, we have education villages where there are many flagship institutions coming. And we are again promoting this uh, movement of people, East Africa uh, through Mauritius and uh, right around the world. So it all depends where you want to pitch yourself. Yes. And of course, we look at different countries right across the continent, a lot more, some more populous than others. So, and we look at the figures and the statistics that are to come in the years. And the population growth in Africa is very visible, it's rising. So the, the data is there. Um, the government need, all the governments need to be getting together to look ahead and actually to do something and to really facilitate this. And if they don't, it's not alone what we heard in the other panel saying that investors are going to miss it, but the, the continent itself is going to miss it. So there's, there's a tremendous sense of urgency, I think, around at the moment in, in, in a way, you know, just doing everything. 
It's the highway, the highway has almost been built, it's about time to get on it and really get it in place. You've talked about uh, the youth of Africa. We've always been, been hearing all the headlines that uh, we talk about the youth dividend. But this youth dividend, if you don't manage it properly, instead of being a boon, it can become a bane. So we have to be very mindful, how do we engage with this youth? And again, how do you create the appropriate entrepreneurial environment for them to engage in? It comes in with a, a suite of, uh, of initiative, a suite of uh, whatever government can put in place uh, to, to make it happen. But just government, government and private sector as well, because all the time we put emphasis on government. Yes, government can do it, but there also has to be this public-private partnership along with entrepreneurs to, to make it happen. And uh, up until uh, we, we don't get this right, we can have a, a big issue on our hands because uh, we've seen that if we don't engage with the youth, if we don't channel that energy into a creative initiative, uh, we'll be in trouble. From many of the leaders over the last two days, we've been hearing a tremendous sense of optimism. And also, we're hearing really that we're looking at right across the board where we're really seeing a government's and the legal system really cracked down on corruption right across the board, really looking internally, and also how the concept of digital identity too is actually making sure that there's, a, there's another eye on any possible corruption that might be out there. So it's giving more confidence, I think, to the investor, but it must also be giving confidence to the youth to think they look ahead and see a good future for them to stay at home. Why would they go elsewhere? Do you feel that, and you know, when you look across the continent, do you feel that things are getting better and that the improvement and the governance and everything has been perhaps taken a lot more seriously and certainly, I think, talked about more? People are, people are more transparent about it. You know, we talk about a lot of corruption. I mean, corruption, I have been saying all the time, it's a tax on the poor. There's no, there's no question about this. We have to, to tackle corruption. But again, this is something that I would like to, to put across. For every corrupter, there is a corruptee. So we have to tackle the entire scheme and, and, and look at this globally from the group perspective. Globally, indeed, yes. But having said this, if we are going to be serious, and this is what we are going, going, doing in Mauritius, is providing a, 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 a situation where we have the rule of law, where we tackle corruption, and uh, we actually uh, make sure that the investor is, feels safe and, of course, uh, has all the tools uh, with which to work. And one area that we're going into, we're di digitizing quite a few of the services so that when it comes to accessing, for example, getting a permit, it's being done digitally. The revenue authority is almost entirely digitized. So we're going down that route, but of course this also means investment in IT, improving the bandwidth and all that goes with it in terms of, uh, of investment. So this is all work in progress. I'm just quickly looking. Do we have a, a question standing in the audience or? No, I don't, I don't think we do. Um, we've heard from many of the entrepreneurs who've been here. Many of them, in fact, have spent some time abroad. You talk to many of the very successful entrepreneurs and you actually, they'll say, I have an office in London and Lagos, or I have an office in New York and back in, in Kenya or wherever. The, it, it is actually happening that we're seeing a lot of good business people out there waving the African flag and doing it very well because they're coming back themselves oh. and investing. Is this something you think that you want to see more of? Because ultimately, the mo there is money in Africa, but there's a lot of money around the world looking for good investments. And again, what they were also saying, if the investors miss Africa, around now, they'll be paying very dearly in the years to come. There are many opportunities on the continent. If I take one sector, for example, agriculture, we've just, yes. I've just heard a few examples given agriculture. Agriculture, uh, Africa has 60% of arable lands in the world. And fortunately, the system is that uh, this sector has been uh, essentially rain fed. There has not been a lot of uh, proper uh, kind of, we've missed on the green revolution. And uh, it's a sector that young entrepreneur can make a lot of headway uh, in this sector, uh, where women also have a big key role to play because whatever we say, women feed Africa. 
but this, this is the fact, yeah. with this effect, but we have to remove the cliche of uh, the African woman with a child on her back in the sun with a hoe trying to do agriculture. And this is not the way we do it. We have to make it a bit more sexy and make it more interesting for the kids to come back to. But I think it is a sector, uh, if you look at energy, if you look at water, if you look at agriculture, and all these areas, if you look at traditional knowledge, and traditional knowledge has a huge potential in addressing climate change, because I, I'm, I'm a strong believer that while science has solutions, traditional knowledge has solutions, yes. if we bring the two together and create that third way, we can make a lot of impact in addressing, tackling, uh, 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 adapting to climate change, and of course with the appropriate technology. I mean, these together, I mean, we've seen, for example, what M-Pesa has done in East Africa and Kenya in terms of mobile money. But I think with technology, we will be able to make a huge difference in tackling all, well, most of the challenges that the continent is facing, and of course, also provide solution to the rest of the world. And I think coming back to the huge agricultural opportunity that is in Africa, um, I mean, tremendous land, lots of land around mm -hmm. the place, and you look at all of the international companies that are going in there, growing um, what shows up on the shelves of the top trendy supermarkets around Britain and all over the world. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know if they've missed the Green Revolution. They probably haven't done enough about it. But everybody has to eat, and everybody has to eat in Africa. And in fact, sadly, you missed some wonderful, an African chef here last night uh, doing some wonderful displays where we were there looking at the, the fashion, the music, the art, and indeed some lovely cooking. So again, I mean, the growth that could be there, and also I think that, that awareness of what they actually have, the natural resources, not just you know, the few countries that have oil and gas and minerals, but actually almost bringing it back to the land where we, we see tremendous growth in that in other countries. And I think, again, perhaps they can learn from that so much more because they have access to the internet, they have access to what's going on in other countries. Different stories, but you know, possible to recreate it maybe. I will uh, disagree with you there. Okay. The future of Africa is the youth of Africa. The future of Africa is not what's underground. The underground can help improve the indicators, but ta having channeling the energy of the youth is going to be a tremendous asset for the continent. This is the route we have to go, and this is why we need to create this enabling environment, provide the technology, uh, change the mindset, and of course do it through education and do it through gender as well because we need to bring in the African girls on board as well and uh, this again we have to do that at a very early age so that we bring that self-confidence that she can do anything and I think if we bring that energy forward with the appropriate enabling environment I think there's no reason why the continent has to remain in the state that it is right now. It can move forward. And I think what we're also beginning to see I think many places in Africa that brought that gave the opportunity to women to be educated. I mean, there are so many powerful women in Africa already, not enough, but then again, we could put global statistics on that one. But we are seeing, and we have with us here, too many ministers, many leading African CEOs and business women that are growing up there. So again, role models, and like yourself, I think there's, there's no stopping uh, the women, I think, when you look at a situation like that. And again, is it, it's about the education. It's about, it's about the whole ecosystem giving them the opportunity, making, giving them the confidence, making sure that they can see this work. But is it about bringing everybody to the table and it's not a government job, it's not private sector, it's not education, and is that cooperation happening enough or perhaps your coalition is going to be the one to lead that? Coalition can do it, institution can do it, but you know, change will happen one family at a time. Until the time when the brother and the father say to that girl that she can do anything, I think the time will come when this happens, then that will be a real game changer. Because we can talk about institution, we can put in place everything, but also we need to change that mindset. And that can only happen at the level of the family. Because we must not forget that the family has a very, very big role to play in the, the life. And in my case, my biggest cheerleader has been my father. So, and I'm very, very happy, very proud he's still around. And uh, to see that his investment hasn't been properly has been wasted, so that's very good. <laughs> I would think he's very, very proud of his <laughs> investment indeed, I'm sure he is. Just a closing thought from you, and perhaps staying on that too, um, in terms of you know, bringing it back to basics really, as you say, and it is about the mindset of, of the whole country, I think. So we can have technology, digitization, 
good government, good governance, all of that's in place. But is it time, do you think, that there's perhaps been the, the, the narrow thinking sometimes, and I think we've seen this in many countries around the world, that, that when that widens and expands, um, it's limitless in terms of what can be done? I think it can be done, and I think if I may sum it up in three words, and this applies not just to women, but also to men, I think what we have to keep on doing is keep on dreaming, and keep on daring, and keep on acting. I think this is the message that I, would, that I have lived, and I think this is the message that should work. Uh, dream, dare, and act. And indeed, I, I think you're very much living proof of that, and we're absolutely thrilled that you've taken the time to dream, dare, and to act, and to Thank take you. the time to be with us. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. The president of Mauritius, Amina Gurub-Fakim. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's been a delight to have you here. Thank you. And thank you.